Uh, we are in chapter 3 of Zechariah. Chapter 3, if you're new, um, you're, we're, we're only four sermons in, so I, I would challenge you to go catch up and gain a little context uh, so you can understand what's going on. Um, but we're in chapter 3, I would say, uh, one of the more important visions of the eight visions uh, that we'll be walking through. This is the middle vision, or one of the middle visions. Let me read it. Let me lay the text before you. I'll pray, okay, and then we'll get in, into God's Word. And what we're going to see is this picture of God's grace, this picture of God's infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible grace. And we know how he's shown us that. He has shown us that in our great high priest, Jesus. And I want you to keep this in your mind, that there is not a sin that you've committed if you're in Jesus. If he's your Savior, there's not a sin that you've committed that disqualifies you from his grace. What we're going to see is grace renews what our sin has ruined. Here's, here's the text. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the Lord clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, then let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Verse 6. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who, assi who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in desperate need for you to speak to us. So we pray that you do. You comfort those who are feeling guilty for their sin. Remind them of what's been done in Jesus. And those who are in sin, who have not trusted in him by faith, you would bring them to repentance to see the price that was paid for sinners through Jesus. So Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, you would comfort our hearts, you would correct our minds, and you would point us to, your, to our Savior, your Son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm willing to bet this morning that there are genuine Christians in this room who are sitting here who feel that maybe your sin has disqualified you from God's grace. Maybe you feel this morning that you're not good enough to be here because you spent last night getting drunk. Or maybe there's someone in this room who again this week looked at porn and this is like the fourth or fifth time this month this week, and you just, you just can't seem to kick it, and you're walking under this weight of condemnation and shame, and, and when we sang this morning, you were too embarrassed to even sing. Like, you couldn't even look up at the screen to see the words on the screen, let alone utter anything from your lips. Or maybe your prayer life isn't vibrant right now. You've been distant from God's word and you feel like it's just too hard right now to, to, to turn back to him, that, that, that he somehow walked away from you because, because of your, you, you dis, distancing yourself from him. Or, or maybe you're walking in another, another sin, a, a sin that you haven't even confessed. You, you don't want to confess. You're, you're embarrassed to confess it. And, and as a result, you're walking in shame. You're, you're walking in guilt. You, you feel that somehow that your, your sin has disqualified you from God's grace. And, and every person on that list really has the same thing in common. Instead of walking in the assurance 
assurance that the gospel gives us, instead of walking in the rest that the gospel provides for us and, and moving us to repentance and communing again with the Lord, you, you are distancing yourself from God. And, and what you're doing is you're walking under the weight of condemnation. You're walking under doubt, despair. You're walking under discouragement. And, and you're saying, God, have I disqualified myself from grace? But here's what what I know and what this text shows us this morning. I've got great news for you. If you're in Christ, right, I'm speaking to Christians. I'm speaking to those who have trusted in Jesus by faith. If you are in Jesus Christ, there is no sin, no matter how dark it is, there, there is no sin that disqualifies you from the grace of God that's yours in Jesus Christ. We know that because in Romans, Paul writes this, that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. Nothing. So there is no sin that's too deep that Jesus' blood can't erase. There is no list of sin that Jesus' Jesus's blood can't, can't take off of your record. This is what we see in our text this morning. We see that God's grace renews what sin has ruined. This is vision four of eight that God gives Zechariah. If you haven't seen this, the visions work concentrically. Imagine in your mind a, an hourglass flipped on its side and you have the Visions one and eight working, uh, working to communicate what God is doing in the world and then what God is doing to God's people's enemies and then what God, God is doing to his people and his city. Last, last week we saw vision three, God promising to rebuild a city, right? Promising that, that he will once again dwell with his people. But, but I'm sure that left them to question, but God, what about my sin, right? It is, it is my sin that has exiled me. Remember the remnant is, has been exiled. They, they've returned from exile. Why were they exiled in the first place? Well, they were exiled because of their immorality, their injustice, their idolatry. And, and I'm sure they felt like many of you in this room, like my sin has disqualified me from you being with me, God. I don't see the temple being rebuilt. Sure, I hear you telling me that it's going to be, but with my eyes, I don't see it. And here we see God reminding them that their sin has not disqualified them from his grace, that that he will renew what sin has ruined. And he shows them this through this fourth of eight visions. Remember all of these visions all on the same night. And here we get to the middle of the hourglass, kind of the glue that holds both together. We get very specific. So we've moved from the world to God's enemies, to God's city, to now specific people in the city of God. We have names here. We have a list of names, important names. And we're going to see that grace renews what sin has ruined. And we're going to see it by seeing three renewing works of grace. The first is found in verses 1 through 3. Grace rebukes. Grace rebukes. Notice the vision begins with these words. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now we're not sure who the he is. It seems like it would be the angel who has been the the tour guide for Zechariah this whole time. However, we don't know that for a fact. In fact, many people believe that he is referencing verse 13 of chapter 2 in the original original book of Zechariah. There were no chapter and verse divisions. What did the end of chapter 2 tell us? That the Lord had stepped down from his holy dwelling? Perhaps this is God himself pulling back the curtains to provide extra comfort to the remnant to say, I want to tell you how big my grace is. You might be doubting me. You might be doubting that I'm actually going to dwell with you. You might feel that your sin has disqualified you from me dwelling with you, but I'm I'm going to show you that that it is not. I've dealt with it. So here we see, whether it's the angel who guided Zechariah or the Lord himself, this heavenly court scene, And we know that from the language. The the word standing before the angel of the Lord give give a legal connotation. And we have a few participants, if you want to take some notes, just to make sense of what's happening here. We have the accuser of the brethren. Literally, in the Hebrew, this, this word is the accuser. It's translated Satan. I believe this is Satan. This is our great adversary, our enemy. We have sin the world, and we have Satan who all oppose us as God's people. And here, Satan stands as the prosecuting attorney. We have the angel of the Lord who will also speak on behalf of the Lord. Uh, We've referenced him in past sermons, so I'm not going to go over that in detail, but we know this is the second member of the Trinity. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus, right? So, So we'll say this is Christ himself before he clothed himself with flesh. He is 
He is the Lord, but is distinct from the Lord. He will speak on behalf of the Lord. And what is he doing? He is the defense attorney, but he also has another role. He is also the judge. He has two roles. He's the defense and he's the judge. And then we have Joshua, the high priest, not to be confused with Joshua, who who came after Moses, leading God's people in the book of Joshua, not the same Joshua. Okay, we're, we're thousands of years past that on the timeline of the Old Testament. This is Joshua, note the high priest. This Joshua was of the lineage of, of Aaron. Not just priestly lineage, but of high priestly lineage. Aaron, Moses' brother, who was the first high priest in the, uh, installed in the book of Exodus. You guys remember that when we studied Exodus. So, so we have one who was, he was probably born in Babylon, in exile, and he's coming back with God's people. Uh, so he's back, and he, his, his role is to be the high priest when the temple is, is rebuilt. But it's significant that he is on trial, because if he is on trial, guess who else is on trial? All of them. Why is that? Well, if you can recall the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, when we walk through Genesis, we reference the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was a catch-all for the sins of God's people. It happened once a year, Yom Kippur. The, the high priest of God's people, he would, there, there were several things that went on that day, but you just need to note this. In summary, he stood as a representative of God's people to make atonement for all of their unknown sins, unconfessed sins, right? Because daily they would go to the tabernacle to make atonement for their sins, but there were many hidden sins, sins of motive, sins not only of omission, but commission, sins of thought and deed that they had forgot about. I mean, think about on a daily basis how many sinful motives we have we don't even think about. Well, this was the catch-all. This day caught those sins. This day made atonement for all of those sins so that God's people, their sins had already been dealt with. They were dealt with that day. And as the representative, he, he, he stood in the place of God's people and would deal with their guilt. And it happened uh, with two pictures the picture of expiation and the picture of justification. We'll get, that, get to that in a, min, in a moment. What you need to see is because he's on trial, everyone's on trial. Now, what is he on trial for? We'll skip verse 2 and look at verse 3. Joshua is standing before the judge. He's standing, note this, in filthy garments. There's a problem here. The evidence is stacked against him. He is guilty. Okay? You need to know this. He's not innocent. He's guilty. This would be as if the defendant in a murder trial shows up with a knife with the blood of the victim on the knife and he's holding it, wearing a shirt saying, I'm guilty. He is wearing not only his own sins, but the sins of his people. Now the word filthy hides what this word really is. Okay, so for a few moments, allow me just to be grotesque simply because the Bible is grotesque when it comes to our sins. The word filthy, this is the only time in the Old Testament this word is actually used. It comes from a root word that is used for human feces and excrement and human vomit. Just let that sit for a moment. Maybe you think your little lie is just a stumble. Maybe it's just a hiccup. Maybe you think, men, when you gaze at that woman at the gym and you undress her with her eyes, well, that's not that big of a deal. Grace will cover it. And listen to me. Yes, grace does. But do not cheapen grace by diminishing your sin. Your sin is a sour stench in the nostrils of God. It is a hideous, vile sight in the, in the sight of God. This would have been terrible to not only look at, but terrible to smell. This would have been hideous. This would have been odious. He is wearing the filth, not only of his own sins, but the sins of all of Israel right there before God. Get that in your mind. If you cheapen sin, you cheapen what? You cheapen grace. So, so the implications for you is every little sin that you commit, whether you know it or not, is hideous. It's odious before a holy, pure, and righteous God. Hang on to that. Hang on to that. Now, what does, what does the angel of the Lord do? What does Jesus do? He rebukes the accusations of Satan. Go back to verse 2. The angel of the Lord speaks as if he's the Lord himself. He is the judge, but he's the defense attorney. I rebuke you, O Satan. 
These charges are inadmissible. Though they are true, before Satan ever gets a word out of his mouth, Jesus intercepts the accusations and he says, they will not stand in this court. We don't even know what Satan was going to say. And notice, Joshua doesn't say a word. He doesn't speak. He doesn't try to provide a defense. He doesn't show any evidence that he's innocent. He shuts up. And Jesus speaks. And what does Jesus leverage? What is the reason why Jesus can can say these charges are inadmissible? He says, because I have chosen Jerusalem. This is a brand plucked from the fire. It wasn't judgment. It wasn't the exile that purified Jerusalem. It will be God's grace that does that. That couldn't do it. I plugged them. I saved them. I rescued them. I snatched them from Babylon. I have chosen them. Get this in your mind. Now, this is not a sermon on election or predestination. If you're wrestling with that, talk to your elders. We'll walk you through this. But, but this is all of God's grace. The angel of the Lord doesn't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save him. I rebuke you, O Satan, but because of the good in Joshua, because he will be my priest and he's got a lot of good works that, that he's going to. He doesn't do that. He says, because I have chosen Jerusalem. One, one author said this, Israel standing with God, has, his promised affection towards them has never been grounded on their own worth. God would restore and bless his people simply because he had chosen to do so out of his sovereign grace, his mysterious, incomprehensible grace, he says those charges won't stick. Remember that. If you are in Christ, and you're not gonna make sense of it right now, it's okay. You've been chosen, and it's grace that intercepts the accusations of Satan that are happening right now. It says those won't stand. Grace also reclothes. Secondly, grace reclothes. Notice verses four and five. The angel said to those who were standing before him, these are probably the ministering angels around the throne of God, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I've taken away your iniquity. I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, this is Zechariah. It's almost like Zechariah can't contain it. He yells out, put on the clean turban. Put the turban back on his head. And they did. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And notice the angel of the Lord did nothing. He just stood by. That's important. Underline that. What's going on here? I'll tell you in a moment. The angel of the Lord does the unthinkable. He commands his angels to unclothe Joshua, to get their hands on the filth, the vile, the vomit, the excrement. And he says, take it away. Notice Joshua doesn't lift a finger. Joshua doesn't remove the angels do. We call this expiation. We call this taking your sins and removing them from your record. This is what happens when Jesus rescues us and saves us. This reclothing process is a process of salvation. You need to see that here. God is giving us a glimpse into how he would make us right with him. He reclothes us. How? Well, first he takes our filth away. So on the Day of Atonement, two things would happen. The Day of Atonement, the the high priest would identify with God's people by laying his hand on a scapegoat. You guys, we've talked about this. He would would be signaling that the guilt of God's people would go onto this goat, and that goat would be sent away, right? Never to be seen again. That's expiation. That means God takes our record of wrong, and he removes it completely from our account. We just sang about it. We stood neath a debt we can never afford. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. And he takes the debt and he says, nope, you don't have to pay it. That's expiation. The Bible and the Psalms pictures, pictures the, the depths of the ocean. How deep is the ocean? I mean, in certain places, we're talking miles deep. And he takes our sin and throws them throws them in the depths of the ocean, never to be brought up against us again. That's expiation. But listen, there's two sides of a coin. I think many of us think that salvation is limited to only expiation. That's not good enough. 
You have too limited a view of the gospel if you think the gospel just forgives you of your sins and gets you out of hell. There's something else that happens. What else happens? Joshua's not there just naked before Jesus, is he? No, he's got to wear the right clothes. And what does he do? Jesus says, angels, put on the clothes, put on the garments. And they put on him pure garments, the priestly garments that we read about in Exodus 28. This is called justification. We need something more to stand before God than just the verdict that we're not guilty. So yes, our record has been wiped clean, but we need something there in its place. We need righteousness, and it can't come from us because we're not righteous. So we get an alien righteousness, a foreign righteousness. We get the righteousness of Jesus. That's what this is. That's justification. We are justified, declared right. I want to pause here because there, there is this permeating thought, and I've lived in the South long enough, the Bible Belt, and I hear it all the time as a pastor. And it really, it really makes me want to stop and like, correct the person speaking. There is this idea that somehow before I can come back to God, I have to clean myself up. Maybe you've thought those same things. Maybe you've heard someone say that, right? I, it's just not like God wouldn't want anything to do with me in my mess and my filth. Before I, you know, before I step foot in church, before I come over to small group, I've got to get some things right. If you think that way, you know what you're doing? You're actually just adding another nasty stain to your garment. That's called legalism. That's called self-righteousness. You cannot clean yourself up. Jesus doesn't look at Joshua and say, hey, Joshua, I need you to scrub those clothes and then I'll take them. Jesus takes the mess. He takes the junk. It doesn't deter him. He says, give it to me. Only I can clean it. There's an old hymn that I used to remember singing in my church when I grew up, and it's never left me. It's called Just As I Am. You guys remember that song? Just As I Am. I come to Jesus just as I am in my filth, in my mess, and he takes it. He expiates, and he justifies, and there's one more thing. Because Zechariah, he was like, wait just a second, you're forgetting one thing. Right, he's got his ephod, he's got his sash. Go read Exodus 28. I don't have time to go over the priestly garments, which all pointed us to Jesus. We talked about that when we walked through Exodus. But there's one thing. Put the turban on his head. What is that? Cover his head. Crown his head. Go to Exodus 28, though. We're going to look at two verses real quick. Three, I'm sorry. Verses 36 and through 38. This is God commanding Moses about the turban on the priest. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like an engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue, and it shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron shall, note this, bear the guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. Oh, man, there's a lot there. You can offer worship to God. You can offer sacrifices to God and do it in a wrong way. But this covers it. It shall be regularly on his foreheads. Note this, that they, here's the purpose, that they may be accepted before God. We call this positional sanctification, not progressive sanctification. That's what's happening through the ongoing work of the Spirit in your life. But when you believe upon the Lord Jesus by faith, three things happen instantaneously. Expiation, boom, wiped clean. Justification, boom. And then you're raised to a positional status where you are set apart, accepted, God, the holy God of all creation, the pure God of all creation that cannot look and dwell with sinners, cannot see sin, cannot be in the presence of filth and sin, makes you holy. That's what we see here. And notice, the whole time Joshua does absolutely nothing. He doesn't lift a finger. He doesn't utter a word. This is giving us a picture of our salvation, that we are saved by grace alone, and that happens through faith alone. And what is faith? Joshua exercises faith. He receives what God has done. He doesn't wrestle against it. He doesn't push against it. He simply sits there and let Jesus clothe him with his righteousness. Do you guys see that? Rebukes, reclothes, recommissions. That's third. It gets better. Verses six and seven, the angel of the Lord solemnly assures Joshua. So 
So here, here's the picture, because we got, a, got two scenes. We got God cleansing Joshua, and then God commends, uh, commissioning Joshua. And sometimes we, we like to reverse those, but we can't, because the Bible never reverses those things. Obedience is always after justification. So practical, progressive sanctification is a result of us being justified, declared righteous. Remember, not just not guilty, not just innocent, but righteous. That leads to obedience. That's what we see here. He says in verse 7, if you will walk in my way. Now, this is the angel of the Lord speaking as the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate Christ commissioning Joshua. If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. Underline, and I will give you right of access among those who are standing here. Who are those that are standing there? Because we have some other people in this vision too. I think he's talking about the cherubim, the ministering angels around the throne room of God. And here we see progressive sanctification following positional justification. God reclothes and then recommissions us to obedience, not the reverse. And he says, walk in my way. He gives some conditional requirements. Walk in my ways. Keep your heart set on obedience to my word, Joshua. Keep charge of my courts. Remember, the temple will be rebuilt. He's already promised that. As the high priest, you have a responsibility Unlike the past, when the temple was defiled with idolatry, you're going to keep that out, Joshua. That's what he means by keep, keep my charge. He said, keep the temple free of defilement and idolatry. And then here's the result. You will rule over the temple. You'll be in charge of my temple. And you will have this access that only the ministering angels have. Now, think about this. If you were the remnant, Here's the promises you've heard in these visions. Your enemies destroyed. The city rebuilt. The temple rebuilt. Access to the God who once abandoned you, right? You were in exile for 70 years in a pagan land, has brought you back, and he says, access to me that only angels get is now reopened. Now, on the other side of the cross, we know that Jesus <clears throat> fulfilled this, right? Joshua didn't walk in 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 perfect obedience. Jesus did, and now those of us who are in Jesus, because of our great high priest, we have this access that was promised to Joshua, right? I've said this. We read the Old Testament through the lens of the cross. Have to. Have to. We're recommissioned to have an access that only angels have. What does that mean for you? It means this. At any time of your day, though God might seem like he's thousands of miles away, you can simply cry out and he's right there. You can plea and petition to God. You can bring your sins to God. Listen, he's already dealt with them. It's a picture. He's already dealt with them right here. Past, present, and future. You can confess your sins. You can, this, is, this is inviting us to prayer. This should change our prayer life knowing that we have unhindered, unlimited access to the God of creation. You don't have access like this to the president. You don't have access like this to your boss. But God, who is, who is above all things, gives you unlimited access. Not only that, he has made us priests. Look at verses 8 and 9. Hear, O now, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you. Who, who would Joshua's friends be? I think those are the other priests. So we have the angels, the ministering angels around the throne of God, and we have the other priests, right? It wasn't just the high priest that ministered on behalf of God's people in the tabernacle in the temple. There were other priests that ministered the covenant, that cleansed the temple, that burned the incense, that offered prayers to God. Notice this. He said, you guys are a sign. Underline that. You men are a sign. Behold, I will send my servant, the branch. Let's Keep reading verse nine. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. There's a lot going on there. Let's, let's think about this, though. Joshua's friends are a sign. These priests are a sign. What does a sign do? Well, a sign points beyond itself, right? Think about the sign outside. It says four points church. Is the sign the church? No, 
The sign points to us. We're gathering inside this building as the church. All signs point to something beyond themselves. Here, God is saying the priesthood points to something beyond itself. It points to two things. It points to, number one, the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. This was an important doctrine for the Roman, um, I'm sorry, for the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> this very important doctrine. We don't need a priest anymore. In Christ, the veil's been torn. We need no priest. He is our great high priest. There is one mediator between God and man. We're all priests. And here's the deal. We don't make continual sacrifices to atone for our sins. That sacrifice has been made. The Bible says now your entire life, wherever you are, is an offering of worship, is a sacrifice of worship, just as a priest. Remember the priest, all they did was work in the temple. That was their life. We're priests. All of our life is worship. That's what I think this is communicating. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a banker, you're a school teacher, I don't, it's worship, all of it, all of it. You gotta see it as that. You have access to God, you can worship God wherever you're at, you can commune with him in his word. This is all of the implications of being a priest now that we're on the other side of the cross. But notice, not only are the men with Joshua a sign of our priestly status, but they pointed to another priest because right after that, the text says in verse eight, behold, I will bring, underline two things, my servant, the branch. What is this? They pointed to a better priest who is a servant and a branch. Now in the Old Testament, there was a messianic promise that was associated with a servant. There would be a servant, a servant of the Lord who would come, who would rescue God's people and who would rule over God's people. This is the promise of a king, but not just any king, because he would rule in humility. Go to Isaiah 53. How would he rule? By taking the sins of his people on himself. He didn't look like a king. He's not the king you and I would have picked. So we see that the... the, the the pointer to this messianic promise of a servant and also a branch. Don't think of a branch that's attached to a tree. Think of a branch that's actually detached from a tree and a sprout coming off of that branch. Why is that the imagery? Well, remember, this was a messianic promise, the promise of a king. Judah's failed. There is no king in Judah. Who's the king right now? The remnant are under the reign of Darius. He's the king. Now we're going to meet Zerubbabel next chapter, who's the governor. But the kingly line seems to have been cut off. Like God's not going to fulfill his promise that he made to David in 2 Samuel 7 that there will always be a king from your line on the throne. But notice, even in the covenant unfaithfulness of the kings of Israel, God is promising that he will preserve a small branch and it won't be cut off forever. Though they seem to be cut off, God's going to preserve, picture a sprout. So a servant and a sprout, a sprout from a branch. We see this throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah 11, 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from its root shall bear fruit. God's promising there will be a king when all seems to have been cut off who will come and he will rule in humility, but he will rule in righteousness over my people. But... He's talking to priests. He's saying, you will be the sign. Here we see this unfolding mystery of the Old Testament showing us that the one who is our Savior will be a priest and a king. And this is coming through the words of a prophet. Before Joshua, the Lord noticed in verse 9, has set a stone with seven eyes. We see this imagery in the book of Revelation pointing to the comprehensive nature of the Holy Spirit. Seven being the number of completion. Seven being the all incomprehensive wisdom and knowledge of God that we've already seen on display in vision one. But I think this is also a reference to the Holy Spirit. This is a bit of a mysterious verse. Notice this stone's gonna have an inscription on it. It's debatable what this single stone that's set before Joshua is. We really don't know. Commentators are split down the middle. It could be a stone that Joshua wears. Remember, the high priest wore stones representing God's people. They bore the guilt of God's people. That's a, that's a great guess. I, honestly, I don't know. It could be a physical stone in the temple. I mean, this is in the context of these people rebuilding the temple. I lean that way, but I'm not, I'm not gonna be dogmatic. Jesus referred to himself as the stone that the Jews stumbled over. 
He was the cornerstone in the New Testament. So that makes sense, that it would be a physical stone of some sort. But notice the important thing. On it will be an inscription. We don't know what the inscription will be, meaning that something's going to be etched into this stone. Something's going to be scarred, in a sense, into this stone, and something's going to take place when that scarring occurs. What will take place? In a single instant, on a single day, the iniquity of Judah will, 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 will be no more. He says, I will remove the iniquity of this land in one day. Now, this would have been unthinkable for them. Why? Well, now remember, many of them were were born in exile, so they didn't have a a whole lot of knowledge of the sacrificial system, but I'm sure they heard stories, and, and they knew that their sins were atoned for all the time, frequently. Like, I had to make a sacrifice Whenever I sinned, I went to the temple to make a sacrifice for my sin. They knew the one, the catch-all day, the day of atonement, but, but that happened every year. Every year. Year after year. There was a continual sacrifice made to, to remove their iniquity. But here God's saying, no, that's going to end. There's going to be one day and all the iniquity from you will be no more. I'm going to remove it. I'm going to take it away. We know what day that is. That's a day we're going to celebrate in just a few weeks. Good Friday. And there's one more thing. So, so here we see. I want to jump, to jump to the last verse. Okay. So we see the, the recommissioning invites us to have access, calls us to be priest, and calls us to mission And in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig. Now, remember, this land had been ravished, hadn't seen much prosperity. And God's saying, I'm I'm promising you peace and prosperity again. That's what a vine tree and a fig tree signify. It's coming. And in that day, which we know on the other side of the cross, Good Friday, when Jesus hung in the place of sinners, He says, all of you are going to be missionaries. You're going to invite your neighbor to come and find peace and prosperity. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. Jesus didn't save any of you to sit on the sidelines. He saved you to be used to invite others to come under the vine and the fig tree, to participate in this mission where he is saving nations, not just not just the Jews, but all nations. We saw that last week. So you don't get a choice. You are a missionary. You're a missionary in your home. You're a missionary in your job. He recommissions us to be on mission. But there's one more point that that we have to get to. One more R. Grace reassures. Keep in mind, this remnant wouldn't see that day. Not with their eyes. This is 519 B.C. That day would happen some 500 plus years later. They were waiting day after day for that one day when the iniquity would be removed. And it seemed like it would never come. They had a promise, but we stand on the other side of the cross. We have the evidence. It's like this. When I was a kid, I really looked forward to my parents taking me to Six Flags. I'm 40 years old, and I do not want anything to do with Six Flags anymore. You guys know what I'm talking about. But when you're a kid, right, and that date was on the calendar, like two weeks were going, you couldn't wait. When is that day coming, Mom? I mean, the, the, the car ride there, it just seemed like it took forever, didn't it? Is this really happening? Like, are we really going, Mom? The car ride back was so much different, though. It wasn't anticipation of it, if it's going to happen. It was taking your mind back to the roller coaster, right? It's taking your mind back to the water slide where you got wet and you probably got really sick too, right? <laughs> it's taking your mind back to what actually took place and you just saying, man, that was amazing. Do you see the difference? There's a difference when you're on the other side of an event. There's one that's an expectation. There's another one that says, I've got evidence so I can, like, I can take my mind back there. No, it really happened. We're on the other side of the cross, This is just a vision. This is just a vision. See, what God was doing here is something he tells us in Romans 3. There's forbearance happening here. Notice in verse 5, the angel of the Lord was standing by. I had to look at this verse two or three times and ask myself, why was this here? He got his hands not dirty. He didn't do anything. The angel of the Lord told his angels to unclothe Joshua, to reclothe Joshua, as he just watched. Why? This was a vision. This wasn't reality. 
reality would come 500 and plus years later when the angel of the Lord wouldn't sit by as a bystander watching in observation, but would hang in Joshua's place in obedience as his substitute. I want you to see this. Everything that happened to Joshua happened to Jesus in reverse. Let me say it another way. For what Joshua to gain, Jesus got the opposite. What you have is because Jesus took the opposite. In other words, you get cleansed because Jesus got your filth. You got grace because Jesus got your wrath. You see, it begins in his descent when Joshua's commissioned to obey. Jesus actually left the access that was promised to Joshua. He left that heavenly access and he actually obeyed fully. He didn't fail. Verse five tells us that Joshua was, was crowned with a turban. What a feeling of enjoyment and excitement and, and relief that must have been. But for Joshua to get the turban, you know what Jesus got on his head? crown of thorns, pressed on his skull until it dripped with blood. Joshua had his filthy garments removed. He was clothed in pure garments. You know what Jesus got? Jesus was stripped naked. You know what happened to his garments? They were divided at the foot of the cross by Roman soldiers who would crucify him. Joshua had the muck and the mire of his filth and his sin taken away. But where did it go? Where did it go? If God is a just God, it had to go somewhere. Jesus stepped by that day and said, leave it there. Because in 500 years, I'm coming and I'm going to put it on myself. And he did. And if you are in him, he's done that for you too. Every sin you've committed and every sin you will commit. He got your filth so you would get his cleansing work. You would be righteous before him. He has covered you with his robes of righteousness. And right now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interrupting the accusations of Satan, rebuking them. He's reclothed you. He's re recommissioned you. And I hope this reassures you. Two things as we close. Number one, be amazed. This is a call to repent and believe. I was speaking to believers. Those who know they're in Christ, when I gave you the list at the beginning of people walking as if they've disqualified themselves from grace. But here's what I know. There are people in the room that think they're a believer, but they are not a believer. Why? You want the cleansing, but you don't want the commissioning. You want Jesus to get you out of hell, but you don't want to live for Jesus now. You don't get verses one through five without verses six through 10. It's one full vision. So one call is to you. Maybe you fooled yourself. That's okay. Jesus is still waiting for you to throw your, your junk, your filth on him. He says, give it to me. I'll reclothe you and I'll recommission you. And now I'm speaking to the person in the room that didn't even know they were dirty. One sin. The lie, the lust, the constantly worrying about your body, that's, that's filth, that's odious. And you, you gotta wear it. And you gotta pay for it. Right? You gotta pay. Like, right? God's a just God. Either you pay or Jesus pays. Well, how does Jesus pay? You do what Joshua did. Receive the grace of God and trust him. Be amazed that God would do this for sinners. Number two, be assured. Now let me call or, or let me, let me, let me uh, direct my attention to those in the room who are walking in condemnation. 
Look at Romans 8, verses 33 through 34. I I need you to know this because Jesus isn't hanging on a cross and he's not dead in a tomb. What happened on the third day? Jesus rose up and Paul says this, who shall bring any charge against God, God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Well, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, it gets even better. Who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed, in case you're doubting, it's happening right now. He is indeed interceding for you. So yes, there is a courtroom going on over your life right now. Yes, you're guilty as charged. You're wearing your filth on yourself. It was the lies you committed this week. It was the lust that you committed this week. It's the hatred in your heart towards someone else. It's the lack of forgiveness. It's the bitterness. It's the envy. It's the self-righteousness. We could go on and on and on. And Satan's trying to throw them at you. You know what Jesus is doing? Shut up, Satan. And he's showing them the scars on his hands. He's shown them I was the stone that was engraved because I took a flogging on my back for them. The payment's been made. Do you believe that this morning? Let me close with a story from Martin Luther. If the band would come up. It says this, I I found it in a commentary, but I want to read it to you. A black spot is still on the wall of castle of a castle in Germany. Wartburg Castle is where Martin Luther was taken for refuge after his historic stand at the Council of Worms. Luther was immensely productive during this period, but he also felt himself suffering at the hands of the devil. He wrote to his friend Philip Melanchthon on May 24th, 1521 about a spiritual depression he had experienced, one in which he dreamed that Satan appeared with a long scroll on which many of his sins were written with care. Each one of them read one by one out loud. He felt as if his sins had disqualified him. All the while, Satan stood, mocked Luther, mocking his pathetic desire to serve God, assuring him that after all, he would end up in hell anyways. Luther writhed in spiritual agony until at last he jumped up and cried out, it is all true, Satan, and many more sins which I have committed in my life which are known to God only, but write this at the bottom of your list. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Then he grasped an inkwell from his table. Luther threw it at the devil who thus fled, leaving the black spot on the wall that still bears testimony to his deliverance hundreds of years later. God's grace is amazing, isn't it? It renews what sins ruin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your immense and measurable grace. Comfort your people. Those who are walking in sin, would they repent and look to you? You're running towards them with your arms open, ready to take their filth. If they are in Christ, it's already been dealt with in Jesus. May we walk out of here renewed and refreshed, comforted in the gospel, ready to be recommissioned to obedience, to live a life of sacrifice and worship to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.